Happy Friday. Daily Bread Drive Through is here. We're here with episode 2015. No, I don't know, 220, but I'm feeling the momentum. I'm feeling the journey. You know, I hope you are too. Um, feeling uh, that depth is taking place as you look back. You know, it's kind of like you go to the gym, you go to the gym, you look in the mirror because you want immediate results. Um, and then it seems like you're not getting what you want to see. You know, we get in the word and you want to come out of it glowing and just feeling your spiritual six pack. And it feels like, oh, it's not what I want it to be. But then boom, one day you look back over a month, you look back over two months, you look back over six months, you look at an old photo and you realize you have changed, you know, um, it is gradual, but gradual plus gradual plus gradual equals gargantuan, you know? So hopefully you're looking back and you can just see, um, how you've grown. You didn't used to get excited um, for the call to get in the word. Now you're excited. Um, you didn't used to really care too much about fellowshipping with people you didn't really know too well uh, over the excitement of the word. And now it's taking place. Um, you were never so excited to see people from other states jumping in our Facebook live group while the teaching's going. Now you're loving it. Uh, most of all, you're looking at the scriptures and, and you're just Seeing it in a, in, a, in a richer and a sweeter way. You know, we have to remember Isaiah, and I'll share a beautiful, beautiful verse in Isaiah. Um, it's Isaiah 61. Let's go ahead and read, uh, and I'll tell you what it says. Isaiah 66, verses 1 and 2. It says, Thus says the Lord, The heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. I love that. The earth is just my ottoman, you know. Heaven is my throne. Earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build unto me? It's kind of like King Solomon in 1 Kings 8 said, Lord, even the universe can't contain you, let alone this house, this temple I have built for you. So the Lord says, where is the house that you will build unto me? Where is the place for my rest? For all these things have my hand made, and all these things have been, says the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor, meaning regarding themselves as spiritually bankrupt apart from God, regarding themselves as nothing apart from God. That's what it means, poor. That's what Jesus means when he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. But he says, this is where I look, though. I've made all of the metals that you could pull out and make a golden temple. I've made the universe and I've made the flat land and the rock for you to build a temple for me. All these things I have made, but here's what I love. Here, gold out of the ground, doesn't impress me, I made it. Diamonds out of the mines, doesn't impress me, I made it. Galaxies, doesn't impress me, I made it. But here's what impresses me. To this one I will look. And then it says this, him that is poor, him that realizes they are nothing without me. We live in a haughty world where people act like their own Lord and Savior. But when the Lord sees one regarding themselves as poor, spiritually bankrupt, nothing without God, not just talking cliche, but real deal, the one that is poor, and of a contrite spirit. Contrite in the Hebrew means to grind, to powder. One that regards themselves as level with the ground. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. We are dust, but made in his image and likeness. We are infinitely more than dust, but we regard ourselves as dust. And then it says this, and him that trembles at my word. So when we're gathering Malachi chapter 3, verse 16, says that God has a book of remembrance a book of remembrance where every time his people think and talk upon his name, he records it. He knows exactly how many daily bread drive throughs we've had. He knows exactly how many daily bread drive throughs you've been on. Exactly how much you're talking about the word of God and telling others to get on the drive through and come to church with you and peep the word, leading Bible studies, worshiping him, talking on his name, sharing about him in a lost and dying world. He has a book of remembrance. So, yo, we're here and we are gathering we are trembling at his word isaiah 66 verses 1 and 2 isaiah 66 verses 1 and 2 isaiah 66 verses 1 and 2 joints of fire they're fire okay so here we go listen 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 monday 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 i want to get into christology i really want to get deep into christology on monday i really want to get into the hypostatic union i really want to get into um christ as one person with two natures the divine nature the human nature fully human fully man i want us to get rocked by that we're going to look at 
some church history. We're going to look at people like Cyril of Alexander and some council and the council of Ephesus. We're going to really look at how people tried to take a heresy. People tried to say Christ is deity, um, but not full humanity. Or you know, We're going to look at all of that as we really get blown away by 1 Timothy 3.16. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. So please be ready for Christology. Um, Christology is the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And, and if you're going to really start, we chose to start our Christology with looking at his pre-existence and his deity, okay? But we're going to jump into uh, a next phase of, of, of our Christology and looking at the incarnation, looking at the hypostatic union and all of what that means. You're going to fall in love with some terms that you've not heard before. You're going to fall in love with Philippians 2. Oh, we're going to have a good time. So I, I got the notebooks out. Um, that is Monday. We're going to have a great, great, great time. Um, so they are right here, okay? Um, today, this is what I thought we would do. Today, I thought we would take a look at, at John the Baptist. Take a look at John the Baptist. We've been looking at Bible prophecy. Do you know the Old Testament references? Um, we know that Christ fulfilled hundreds of Old Testament references, right? Hundreds of Old Testament references. Um, there's a book by a man named Stoner. Um, I believe it's called Science Speaks. Uh, can you check that real quick, please, on Google? All right. DJ Annie is down in Indiana, but today we got DJ Tasha. She's on the, on the ones and twos. And uh, right now she's going to look up. It's Stoner. Um, and it's called Science Speaks. Anyway, he is a mathematician um, and I believe teaches statistics at a university in Texas. He actually did a study, and I believe the study was just, it was looking at the prophecies of Christ and how it clearly shows that Jesus is God, how um, the, the odds of anyone coincidentally fulfilling even eight of the prophecies uh, is like one times 10 to the 157th power or something like that. Did you find the book? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's Stoner. Look Look for the book. It's called Science Speaks, right? It's on Amazon. It's on Amazon. But how much is it? A lot. Yeah, like $500. <laughs> Yo, listen, search around for it. There's a PDF, too. If you Google it, you can find it online. Okay, there we yeah. go. So it's Stoner, S-T-O-N-E-R. There's a free PDF, but if someone is feeling like, yo, I want to have that, like, you know, Indiana Jones, Temple of Doom, Raiders of the Lost Ark, I want that book. Do you? But if you want the free PDF, Stoner, and it's called Science Speaks, but he is breaking down how no human, it is statistically impossible, no human could have even coincidentally fulfilled even 15 of those prophecies, and Christ fulfilled hundreds. My point is this. We know that Jesus is the Messiah. We know that Jesus is God. We know that Jesus is the fulfilled one, um, the one or, or, or the promised one. He came to fulfill all scripture, all prophecy. And we also know that all of what it talks about his second coming will also be fulfilled to the T. But do you also know that while the Old Testament has prophecies concerning Christ, it also has prophecies concerning his forerunner. We've all seen the cartoons and the shows where... You know, before the king comes, the herald comes in, you know, with the trumpet, you know, and first the red carpet and the golden trumpet. And there might be a sash, a velvet sash hanging off the trumpet. And there's a herald that comes to announce the coming king. Well, the Old Testament prophesied that this king of kings, this Messiah, our Jesus, would have a forerunner, a herald, an announcer to announce that he's coming, just as kings do. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, uh, gives us one of the prophecies concerning John the Baptist. John the Baptist was his forerunner, his elder, his herald, his announcer, okay? Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, and it says, The voice of him crying in the wilderness. We're just given this rather mysterious verse saying that he would be a voice and that he would be crying in the wilderness and that he would say Isaiah 40 verse 3 prepare ye the way of the Lord he came to call people to prepare their hearts prepare ye the way of the Lord make straight in the desert a highway for our God now is it saying that the Messiah would be coming in the desert uh, and a way needed to be prepared uh, to make kind of like an oasis in the desert, if you will, as a king, you know, uh, uh, prepare the way, prepare hearts. 
He is not the red carpet, you know, that you throw out on the ground, but prepare hearts. May the red carpet of your heart be laid out for him who is coming to the wilderness of a lost world and sin and dead formalism and everything else, right? A sin sick world. Isaiah 40 verse 3 says that. Talks about John the Baptist. Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. Interestingly, yes, there's 66 books in the Bible, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. But in between Malachi and Matthew, in between the closing of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, there's 400 years of silence. There was 400 years where there was no, thus saith the Lord, there were no more books of scripture written. There were no more Zacharias and Jeremiah's and Isaiah's, you know, and Daniel's coming on the scene and writing books, 400 years of silence. Yes, dead formalism set in, dead religion set in. Um, man, um, instead of leading people to God, man started leading people to follow them. But in the middle of that too, were still people, that remnant that was holding right to the things of God. They weren't moving the ancient landmarks. They were really waiting for the Lord and passing that down to their kids. We see that when we see Anna come into the temple at some 80 or 90 years old saying, I've been waiting for you. We see that when we see um, Simeon the prophet come into the temple and hold up the baby Jesus at eight days old. We've been waiting for you. During that 400 years of deadness and whackness, there were people, a remnant was keeping it real. I like to pray and hope that we are that remnant that's keeping it real, the daily bread drive through in a day where people are just, man, the word of God is cool. I get enough on Sunday or even on Sunday, you know, don't even bring your Bible to church. We'll just put screens on the word verses on the screen. And you know what I mean? And, 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 and the sermon is more teaching from the word than teaching the word. I like the hope that we are also that remnant that are teaching our kids. No, Psalm one says we meditate in the word day and night right? We regard the word more important than our necessary food. You know, we meditate on these things. We pass down the word. We have the book of the Lord so we can know the Lord of the book. Anyway, Malachi closes with this. Malachi chapter three, verse one, closes with an announcement about the coming herald, the forerunner, John the Baptist, Malachi um, three, verse one. And it says this, behold, I will send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, says the Lord of hosts. So we see Isaiah 40 verse 3 prophesies of John the Baptist. Malachi 3, 1 prophesies of John the Baptist. Now let's go to John the Baptist. Let's, let's go to Luke chapter 3 and really look at his life. You know, if you want to write this down, we want to, we just looked at his predestination. It's prophesied that this messenger would come. He has a supernatural birth, as we'll see in Luke chapter three, his predestination. We're going to look at his daringness in the spirit. Um, and we're also going to look at his darkness in the flesh. Um, John the Baptist is yet another person that shows us that the best of men are men at best. We're going to end by just looking at this great prophet. Um, going into a very dark place. Uh, and then what Jesus does when he goes into that dark place, you know? Um, anyway, so remember, I've recommended two books, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah by Alfred Edersheim. I've also recommended The Great Physician by G. Campbell Morgan. I've shared that if anyone wants a copy, if you consider yourself a regular Daily Bread drive through er but you can't afford the books, send me an email at info at antiochphilly.org and just say, hey, I'd like the books. Give me your address. We'll send you the books, okay? Um, John the Baptist came on the scene when it was, people weren't in the word anymore. People knew it all. They had commentary. They were more into what their favorite teacher said about the word than the word itself. More, it was like a celebrity, um, celebratory culture. You had celebrity rabbis, and it, yo, it's a lot like today. Nobody was digging in the scripts, people would just take someone else's word for it. Oh, they'd be like, Oh, I'm paraphrasing it, and be like, Oh, that's cool, you can paraphrase it. Nobody was like, No, no, don't paraphrase too much, or let me see what it says for myself, like a Berean, Acts 17 11. It was just like, Oh, par oh it paraphrases, it was just getting watered down. I want to read a quote. And I would recommend that you read these two chapters because now I'm going to start giving out some homework. We're going to treat this very much like a class um, as you're coming to get fish, but I'm also going to be teaching you how to fish. These are two of the best books you can have, by the way. Would you please um, read um, 
and I had it and actually lost my page. But that's cool because I'm going to find that page again. I actually had highlighted something I wanted to read. Um, would you please read, um, let's go, let's go, let's go. The announcement of the birth of Jesus. Um, chapter five, what Messiah did the Jews expect? What Messiah did the Jews expect when Christ came on the scene? Please read chapter five of Alfred Edersheim. If you just want to get a sense of how the Jewish people missed their coming Messiah, how the Jewish people to this day still stumble and miss their coming Messiah, but they're so educated. They spend so much time in the word. How can they not see it? It all goes back to this day. Um, read chapter five. I would also recommend that you read the chapter called John the Baptist in here, the great physician. So for those of you that have it, Riley, I got your picture. I know that my son's girlfriend, she's on it up in the Poconos. You got your books. All right, start reading. All right, let's go. I want to read page 115 um, from chapter five of Alfred Edersheim. It says, and the more we realize that Jesus fundamentally separated himself from all the ideas of his time. And check it. We looked at the pre-existence and the deity of Jesus. Who sent John the Baptist? Who chose the style John the Baptist would come in? Because he came in a way where no one was expecting it. Earthly kings with their earthly pomp would have the herald really be a foretaste of the glory, the pride, the swag that they were about to come on the scene with. The heralds would be in velvet and instruments of brass. John the Baptist is in the wilderness. No PA system, no microphone, no megaphone, no bullhorn, eating locusts and honey and cloaked in camel skins. It's like being in like a burlap jumpsuit. I mean, it's like being in a burlap onesie. I mean, rugged. Did he have dreads, locks? I mean, what was he, What? how was he? But it was not with, but remember, Jesus sent him, Jesus as God sent him. This is the style that God has. I want to read this again. The more we realize that Jesus so fundamentally separated himself from all the ideas of his time, the more we realize that, the more evidential is it of the fact that he was not the Messiah the Jews were expecting, but he derived his mission from a source unknown to or ignored by, at the very least, by the leaders of his people. Jesus came fundamentally, he fundamentally separated himself from the ideas of the time. You know, I think that we're living in a day, especially in the American church, where those that are really following what Jesus says, you're going to find yourself fundamentally, I didn't say being uh, contentious, I didn't say breaking up unity. I didn't say not persevering for uh, for unity among the body um, to show the world that we are his disciples by the way we love one another. But I do believe that those in the day we're in, um, that those that are really following what Jesus teaches are going to find that they're going to have to fundamentally separate themselves from ideas and norms in church culture. Jesus said, always suffer the children to come. You know, the other day at Level Up, a kid who's from 52nd and Market brought another kid from 52nd and Market, brought his friend high as a kite. But he says to his friend, come on, I want to take you to a special place, a safe place. He comes in high as a kite, eats a plate full of buffalo wings. Yo, I could tell that this dude, if you didn't know him, you didn't see him, and he was on his grind on that corner, you'd lock your doors at the red light for sure. Easily could be a face on the evening news. You could just tell. Just misdirected, raising himself and, and, and making his own curfew and every other rule. He comes in there high as a kite, eats wings, but he's eating them in slow motion. Then I realized some of our regular level up kids who didn't clear their plate, I go get on them. He just decided to clear all their plates and then sat in a chair and just slumped over because he was just so high. How many churches would allow that today? But Jesus said, always suffer the children. Did he put conditions on it? Suffer the children, but make sure at the door they take a shower. Suffer the children, but make sure you know that they don't smell like weed. Suffer the children, but, but give them the lecture of a lifetime so that they know they're coming in based on conditions. Now, it doesn't mean that we advocate weed, not at all. It doesn't mean that we advocate being slumped over from smoking weed, not at all. But what we wanted to minister to him was Christ and Christ's love and let him know this is the Jesus thing. But yo, that'd be, that's very different than what church culture is about today. 
because everybody's so worried about what everyone else thinks and how they look instead of worrying about how much are we really looking like Jesus. Yo, let's keep it moving. So in Luke chapter three, because here's the, here's, here's the thing with John the Baptist, right? Here's the thing with John the Baptist. Check it out. He was of the tribe of Levi. Luke 3 will tell you that his father, Zechariah, was in the temple doing the priestly duties. When the angel Gabriel appears in Luke 3 and says, you're, even though your wife can't have children, I'm going to give her, I'm resurrect her womb, like he did with Abraham and Sarah in the Old Testament, and she's going to bring forth the, the, the herald, the forerunner, the announcer of the Messiah, right? As you know, his birth was supernatural, and the angel Gabriel said his name will be called John, right? John means God is gracious. Look at that. God is gracious. Okay. John the Baptist is born, and just check this out. If you're of the tribe of Levi, at 20 years old, you are supposed to go into the priestly school so that by age 30, you are ready to begin your public ministry in the system of the priests. But look at how God sends him down. Look at how God has this ministry for his herald, for his announcer. John the Baptist at 20 years old, we get the idea that he just disappeared into the wilderness because Luke chapter three will tell us that he was in the wilderness until the day where he was shown publicly so at age 20, instead of going into the routine of dead religion, instead of just going and being another cog in the wheel of dead religious formalism, where it was just based on celebrating celebrity rabbis and paraphrasing the word and nobody really seeking the heart of God, what does he do instead of going to the schools of the priests? He just goes into the desert and gets discipled by the Holy Spirit. He is just in the wilderness. So if you read Luke 3, you will see um, the supernatural birth and origin. Um, matter of fact, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 1 is his supernatural birth and origin. Luke chapter 3 is actually when he begins his ministry. Um, basically, it tells us in Luke 3 verse 1 when he began his public ministry. Um, Luke chapter 3 verse 4 says, As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Every valley will be filled, every mountain and hill will be brought low, the crooked will be made straight, and the rough ways will be made smooth. Basically, he's coming as a reformer. What John the Baptist came to do was to get people's hearts right for the Lord. It was to prepare the highways of people's hearts for the Lord. He came and where there was just so much churchianity and dead religion and even religion that made people hate the ways of God, he came and shared also that this, this coming king, this coming king would be flipping money changers tables. And he's alluding to stuff like that in verse nine of Luke three, when he says the ax is laid at the root of the tree, he's going to do more than just come and prune stuff. He's going to come and chop down what is in stark contrast to the heart of God and the ways of God and will bring back the way of God as God in the flesh. This is what John the Baptist came on the scene doing. Yo, with no marketing, no Twitter, no social media, no budget, okay? No budget, just filled with the Holy Spirit. This dude is out in the wilderness preaching with such fire that, yo, Gentiles are even going out there wondering what's happening. And then we see in Luke chapter three, verse 10, they're so stirred that they just start saying, yo, what should we do? He's so full of the spirit that when he's done talking, people are like, yo, what should I do with my life? Yo, yo, am I a nice person? Like, am I prideful? Yo, do I play? Am I, am I caught up in churchianity? He rocked the house with nothing but the Holy Spirit. And look, I'm not against using the wisdom of this day. I'm even using technology right now. And then there's ways you could boost the post. And we, we do that kind of stuff from time to time. And all of it has its place. I appreciate my social media gurus. We're in a social media age, but we've always got to still remember this. John the Baptist rocked the house with none of this and just the Holy Ghost in a hunk, in a package that would no formal religious education, okay? For anyone out here that feels that, oh, you don't have the college degree you wish you had, you don't even have the high school degree you wish you had, we have nothing mentioned of his formal education except being discipled by the Holy Ghost. 
Remember, Jesus said the things that the world esteems, God is often on a contrary route with how he does things, right? People are listening to him and they're like, yo, what should we do? He answers and says to them, yo, if you have two coats, give to one that doesn't have one. He's saying start to walk out sacrificial giving so you can start understanding sacrificial love, right? Um, then publicans, tax collectors are coming and saying, what should we do? He said, stop extorting people for money. Yo, Roman soldiers were like, yo, what shall we do? And he says, yo, stop framing people. Don't accuse people falsely. Luke 3, 14, and just be content with your wages. Um, don't, don't be crooked cops. Basically he is rocking the house. You know, time is flying when we're having fun. Basically, Luke chapter 3 and Matthew chapter 3 speaks of the baptism of Jesus. Why did Jesus allow himself to be baptized? Because if you remember, and now mind you, you know, Elizabeth and Mary are cousins. John the Baptist and Jesus are cousins. Okay? John the Baptist knows Jesus, of course. John the Baptist, though, because Christ is fully God, yet fully man, meek and lowly, John the Baptist does not know that he is the Messiah until he sees the Holy Spirit come down on him because he says, I've been given a sign, y'all. The one while I'm baptizing, I've been told by God that while I'm baptizing, whenever I see the spirit come down like a dove on somebody, that that's the Messiah. That does not mean that he doesn't know who Jesus is. He just doesn't know that Jesus is yet the Messiah. But here's a deep thing. When Jesus comes in the water to be baptized, what does John the Baptist say? Yo, you should be baptizing me. Jesus says, no, allow this to happen because it must happen uh, for the remission of sins. What it means is this, is that even though he didn't know that Jesus is the Messiah yet, because he hadn't yet seen the Holy Spirit fall upon him like a dove, Jesus' character was so powerful. His integrity, his heart, how he did what he did, said what he said, spoke, moved how he moved, was so powerful that John the Baptist just doesn't feel that he should be baptizing him. He's like, yo, you should be baptizing me. He is just in awe of his integrity and of who he is as a person. But Jesus says, no, you have to allow this to happen. He's saying like, yo, I'm baptizing people to get them, you know, confessing their sins and ready for the coming of the Messiah. Like, yo, you, you got so much integrity. I, I, I don't even feel like I should be doing this. Jesus says, you have to allow it to happen. Why did Jesus allow John the Baptist to baptize him? If John the Baptist is baptizing people for the remission of sins, right? Why did Jesus allow John the Baptist to baptize him if he's sinless? Because Jesus came to identify with us. He came to identify with sinners even though he knew no sin. That is a baptism of identification. It's not because Jesus had any sin, um, had no sin. It was identifying with sinners like us. So as he goes down into the water, which represents going into the water, dying, because you're holding your breath under the water. It's a type of the grave. You don't breathe in the grave. Then coming up, it's a type of him entering and identifying with us as sinners. The wages of sin is death. He dies the death that we deserve and then resurrects. Wow, right? So look, we're at 1230 already. And I'm really, I'm trying to keep it down to 30 minutes. I tell you what we'll do. Let's come in Monday. Let's look, let's, let's wrap up John the Baptist. But what I want to just highlight is this. Jesus says that John the Baptist is the greatest, that John the Baptist is the greatest of all prophets. Daniel, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Malachi, Jonah, Hosea, Zephaniah, Nahum, Obadiah. He says the greatest of all prophets is John the Baptist. Why does Jesus say that in Matthew chapter 11, verse, verse 11? He's saying that because while all the other prophets were able to say a Messiah is coming, a Messiah is coming, a Messiah is coming, a Messiah is coming, John the Baptist was the only one who could take his finger and point. And John chapter 1, verse 29 say, here comes the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But then Jesus says this, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. What does it mean that as great as John the Baptist was, and mind you, John the Baptist performed no miracles. 
Not one miracle, and Jesus calls him the greatest of all prophets. But what does it mean when Jesus says that even he, even the one who's least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist? See, the kingdom of heaven refers to the church age. Do we really know who we are? Do we really know the power that we have? He that is least in the church age is greater than John the Baptist. He that is least in the church age has more power than John the Baptist. He that is least in the church age has more enlightenment than John the Baptist. He that is least in the church age has more and is greater than John the Baptist. Jesus says that in Matthew 11, verse 12. Matthew 11, verse 11, rather. Let's come in Monday. Let, instead of hypostatic union Monday, we're going to do hypostatic union Tuesday. But Monday, we're going to take a look more at this John the Baptist who came in a way that was very different than the churchianity of that day, but it was the biblical way. And let's think today on, um, are we making sure that we're sticking to the sayings of Jesus and not churchianity? We want to walk in that spirit and power, right, of, of a John the Baptist. Two, what does it mean that we're greater than John the Baptist? And then three, we're going to look at the dark night of John the Baptist's soul um, and what Jesus does uh, and how he ministers to us in the dark night of our soul. We're going to do all that Monday. You don't want to miss Monday. We're having a good time. God bless you. God bless you. Have a great Friday. For those that want to partner with this ministry, by the way, I, I don't mention it a lot because it's not on my mind, but people do ask often. You could give on the cash app, dollar sign, Antioch Philly, or the website, antiochphilly.org slash give. But yo, let's meditate on John the Baptist. Read Luke 1 about his supernatural birth. Read Luke 3 about his uh, daringness in the spirit and his ministry. Read Matthew 3 about the baptism. Uh, and then Monday, we're going to look at Matthew 11, the dark night of his soul, uh, when he even hits a moment of doubt and says, yo, are you really the Messiah or should we just look for another one? Wow. We're going to talk about doubt. Yeah, the best of men are just men at best. You know, even John the Baptist wrestled with unspeakable plaguing doubt. And how does Jesus minister to our doubts? I'm ready to see you on Monday. God bless you. Sunday service too. Um, let's have a good time. Salute.